Uh, my name is Rodrigo Sepulveda, and as a hobby, I do photography, and have a lot of pictures from yesterday on flickr.com slash rsepulveda. Uh, we're going to talk about something dear to my heart today, which is both digital and art. Um, about 150 years ago, a few French people, yes, French people, invented photography in a number of different ways. Fast forward, today, there are about 6 billion uh, pictures on Flickr, um, estimates between 10 and 20 billion pictures on Facebook, and from only artists using very high gear, sophisticated gear, to create photography, we come down to the masses. So our panel today will help us understand uh, the evolution of this sector and this industry, and how we're making money out of it. But before that, uh, I'll introduce you sequentially when you start talking. I like uh, Ted Forbes, who's a fantastic guy that I've learned uh, all about on the internet. He runs a podcast called The Art of Photography uh, that I watch at the gym, actually. And I've learned a lot of things from him. He's going to walk us real quick through the history of photography first. That will kind of help us understand the whole space. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo asked me to prepare a short history of uh, platforms, essentially, in photography, which is not easy to do in five minutes. But uh, if we got the slides up, um, we'll go ahead and start knocking through that. Okay, what you're looking at up here, this is actually what is generally considered to be the first photograph. This was a photograph taken by a gentleman named Joseph Nessifor Nepies in uh, southern France in about 1825. And uh, in contrast to what you see today with photography, this is actually an eight-hour exposure that was taken of his roof. Uh, eight hour? Eight-hour exposure. So the camera was open, came back eight hours later, shut the lens, and then basically stuck this sheet of metal through a bunch of chemicals and came well, up that, with That's an what they call a point and shoot. Eight hours. <laughs> That's a point, wait, and shoot, I think is what that is. Uh, but anyway, thus after this photo, uh, photography as an art was born. Uh, it, it's also arguable, there may have been photos earlier than this, but this one still exists, and this is the first recorded example, 1825 or so. Uh, and generally, throughout the history of photography, uh, if you look at platforms for how artists gain visibility to their work, uh, there have been basically two avenues for doing this. Uh, the first one is through exhibition, so if you have a show at a museum, an art gallery, something like that. The second of which is journalism, specifically photojournalism. So you look at the great war photographers and the great National Geographic photographers, people like that. Uh, those essentially have been the platforms up until the 21st century, uh, where it, things change a lot. And in the 21st century, we have the advent of social media. You know, this kind of started with uh, the internet and personal websites, which led to blogs. Uh, then you have things like Flickr and Picasa and now Facebook and this general explosion of platforms where all of a sudden people can show their work in ways that they've never been able to show before and this is extremely important. Um, another thing I want to talk about is uh, another French photographer, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who uh, generally he had this Let aesthetic. me pronounce that right for you. Henri Cartier-Bresson. <laughs> Henri Cartier-Bresson. Bresson. Bresson. HCB. Uh, the Americans say Bresson. Um, but Bresson, one of the important things that uh, he had this, this kind of ethos, this philosophy towards photography, it was this thing known as the decisive moment. And what is the decisive moment? The decisive moment is when you're going to capture a picture. And mind you, he was a photojournalist. It's being in the right place at the right time, being able to wait, have the patience, and being able to photograph at exactly that decisive moment when the photo comes together. And one thing that I think is specifically important about what we see with that now is this proliferation of smartphones. In fact, I'll go out on a limb, this is my opinion, but I think the smartphone is probably the most significant advancement in photography in several hundred years. And it's not from a technical perspective. You know, even the iPhone, it's not a great phone that's in there. But my point is, is that it's good enough, and that's the important part. Uh, there's apps in there. I can do photo editing. I can, you know, sift through the stuff I don't want. I can find the ones that I do. I can immediately publish it online to the internet, which is extremely significant. Um, and, you know, what we've seen here now is kind of social change, which, or actually a social change, which is leading to industry change. And I think this is what some of my colleagues up here are going to be able to speak to today. Um, there's been some panic around this. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And uh, all of a sudden, you're not able to monetize images in the same way that you used to be able to. Um, I was on a trip in Seattle a couple of years ago, and we were kind of wandering around doing the tourist thing. And at one point, I pulled my camera out. I was about to take a picture. I looked down at the sidewalk and saw this, which uh, this photo opportunity is copyright Getty. So I guess this means that anything that I do artistically in this area belongs to Getty now. I think not, but it uh, depends on how much money you have to take that to court. But anyway, all this to say is we've seen a great change. Uh, some statistics real quick. As uh, Rodrigo already mentioned, Flickr, and these are the latest numbers I could find. Flickr currently has 5 billion photos. That was of September of September of this year. 
And Facebook sees, in contrast to that, about 2.5 million, excuse me, billion per month, which is, uh, that's a lot of photos. So anyway. Uh, a lot of crappy photos or a lot of good photos? Well, no, it is, it's a lot of everything. So it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's shots of the dog and the vacation and the mother coughing and whatever else you want to see. And which is interesting because, and I, I'll turn it over to my colleagues here because, you know, I remember hearing Robert Scoble last year at South by Southwest talking about all this, this you know, barrage of media that we're hit with and the need for curation. What's interesting to me is, yes, I do think there's a need for curation at times, but you don't want to do it at the expense of, uh, of, of blocking out participation because you need those numbers. You need people to want to do it. You, that's what's exciting about it is when the community is allowed to, to, to all come together and, and contribute. And unfortunately, you know, you do get the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, so from a few guys who did a lot of art, we've come to just mainstream digital smartphones. There's one word you forgot to mention. You and I, and probably Jean-Marie and Oleg, grew up with a thing called the Kodak moment. Remember that? Anyone yeah. remember the Kodak moment? Translated into France, into French, you know, mer clic clac, merci Kodak. Well, Natla Nicholas comes from Kodak. She actually runs a social media team out of Europe. And uh, where is Kodak today? Now, I asked you backstage earlier, uh, in the photography industry, isn't Kodak today a bit like Nokia and telephony? Used to be a big brand and not anymore. Um, that's right, but um, as probably many of you know, um, Kodak has been part of the development of photography since more than 125 years. We invented also the first digital camera. We have done um, a big business transformation in the last 10 years from a purely analog company to today a 65% digital company. But 65% um, of your business is digital, is digital not film today. anymore. Okay. And this is not only um, photography, it's also printing. Um, but still today, there is 45 million photos that are taken every day are touched by Kodak technology, either digital or analog. And that is 16 billion photos per year that are touched. And um, we have also, you mentioned Flickr, we have the Kodak Gallery that has 75 million members around the world and that is, has an image stock of 5 billion photos. So it is still, and, and we have digital products today that are really well known oh, in toys, the toys. blogging community, video cameras, this is um, our outdoor version, very rugged, waterproof. Um, if you Google it, you will find um, numerous blogger, but also end consumer videos, diving with the camera, doing snowboarding. So. Um, yeah, we, we definitely changed. So what are the other toys you have here? Um, yeah, it's also our, the Play Touch. It's another version of the pocket video camera, then a digital ca uh, pocket camera of Kodak. We doing sensors um, for Leica, for example, for the Leica M9 still. But also uh, imaging is a bit, uh, printing is a big part of our business today. So we have inkjet printers and also um, graphics communications. Um, packaging, book so printing, etc. So is your, really a company change. Who's your typical customer for all these products? You change. You did a big turnaround at Kodak. You have very big numbers, as you just mentioned, of users, 25 million users, um, 60 billion pictures taken with a Kodak device. Who's your target customer? The main target customers of our digital cameras, for example, are families and uh, moms. It is like really George Eastman once said always, you press the button, we do the rest, and his main uh, target were women because they don't want to know what's inside. They just want to press the button and have the best quality photos, and that is still today. So um, that is, yeah, really the main audience for both, for the inkjet so printers, for the cameras. Your customers is everyone who's not here at the web. All the non-geek people actually but, go to Kodak. <laughs> and at the web, that's our main audience for our pocket video cameras. They are really, we entered the market in this category two years ago, and really we were a new player in the market. And within two years, uh, we improved the products, we listened to the customers through social media, we did even a crowdsourcing activity for finding a new name, because Boston Globe once titled Flip is a flop compared to Codex ZIA, that was the previous model. But they said, but what is with the name? So we said, okay. Then maybe we asked the end consumers um, what we should call our future pocket video cameras. And the winner was at that time, we had really thousands and thousands of um, name suggestions through the blogs, through Twitter. And the winner was PlaySport. And the next product is now PlayTouch. So we keep the name. And this, this is very, very popular in the online community and was really only 
getting popular through social media, through bloggers who tested it and sp spread so the me, word about it. How are it. you connecting with the Facebook generation? All those kids who don't know what the Kodak moment is. We connecting by being present there. That's why that's also the main part of my position. I'm responsible for all social media activities in Europe. So we go where our customers are and that is for example, Facebook, Twitter, but also YouTube. And we have um, local language channels in six European countries since two years. And we communicate everything we do through those channels, also from events like here, but trade shows, new products. Um, you have and a there the video show, right, on YouTube, a Kodak video blogger. Yes. What's that? Um, for example, one of our U.S. marketing managers, he calls himself Vlogger Dude, and every Saturday... Vlogger Dude. Yes, Vlogger Dude. And every Saturday he creates uh, a new YouTube video where he shows um, yeah, ways to use our pocket video cameras. Last time it was he was standing in his living room in a kimono and talking Japanese. And really he has a big fan group today already um, who waiting every weekend. Many of our employees um, contribute to our blogs. We have since more than four years um, blogs, a thousand words plugged in for technical questions and also a blog for the B2B audience. And that's the space where we really can have um, more extensive stories and we get more than 11,000 blog mentions every month. Also, really um, throughout all social media channels, we have about 300 thousand mentions of Kodak online. So we measure everything we do, we plan our social media activities, think I'm surprised about because the word I see most these days on photography is uh, Instagram. No, it's Ipsomatic, it's not Kodak, with our generation, the Facebook generation. It's sharing photos in general, and yes, people like to, that have an iPhone, they like to use those um, applications, but there are more than two billion photos shared on Facebook, I think, every month, and we are about sharing as well. We want to enable people to capture their special moments and share them, and that's why we also present on the social media channels, so they can share their moments with us and their feedback, and we can implement that in our products. So my key takeaway here is that Kodak is back and doing a lot of stuff in the social space. Yes. Okay. We just touched a point with Ted, is that there's a lot of uh, great photography out there, but a lot of crap. So how do we separate the wheat from the shaft? You know, there's a uh, user generated, as we used to call it, like last year, right? So Jean-Marie, you're trying to solve that problem. A lot of bad pictures out there of drunken people at parties, but also a lot of great pictures. Yeah. Correct? <laughs> So, <clears throat> you want to show us some of your great pictures? What do you have? So, and I'll introduce you. Yeah, what, what we are doing with Photopedia, we take a, Mike. a, a, a very special approach. Uh, you know, so far we are taking about the big numbers, uh, how to get, uh, you know, billions of pictures and uh, all of that. And in our case, uh, we, what we do is uh, to try to filter uh, these pictures to get uh, only the best ones so that you get an enjoyable experience. I'm sure you all know about this uh, family, uh, <laughs> you know, night where you have to look at all the pictures that the guy took and you say, oh, why? Why didn't she or he <laughs> you know, no, get As a rid kid, it was a very <laughs> special moment. You know, the Kata carousel that we actually watch slideshows with your parents and their friends and they get drunk, you have to go to bed. I, mean, I remember that as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, put a blanket, white blanket in the So yeah. in our case, first, we, we don't deal with uh, family pictures, so we, we are looking at pictures of a general interest, but the, uh, the issue is exactly the same. If you go to Flickr and try to look at the pictures uh, for a specific subject, there is maybe one out of uh, 100 that is uh, most uh, relevant first for the given keyword and which is, uh, you know, good enough. So what we try to do at uh, Photopedia during the last uh, couple of years is to get a community so of uh, people who were providing with pictures, but at the same time a community of curators, which is maybe even more important, that were making this uh, gesture of uh, taking this one picture that really fits, uh, that is good for the subject, and at the end of the day, we are starting to create a collection of pictures for all kinds, you know, all these concepts that you have in your mind. And we attach them, uh, attach these pictures, so we created uh, this uh, big uh, database of pictures, very high quality and everything. After that, the question is, even if we have that, uh, you know, it doesn't create yet an enjoyable experience because it's, uh, you know, people who are visiting, they come from uh, basically 90% of our traffic is coming from Google. They come here. You know, and uh, you know, it's to do something. They take one picture and uh, they use it, and after that, they will come back because of Google. 
So my big question, and it was back uh, three months ago, or no, more than that, beginning of the year, is uh, I want really to provide an enjoyable experience for, for these pictures. How can I get you know, something that people would really like? And what happened, happened exactly at that time is the uh, iPad uh, you know, came uh, out of the door. So for me, this was clear. This is a new, new way to consume pictures. Uh, and we decided, OK, so now we are the publisher of uh, you know, the new generation, the digital age. Uh, um, you know, generation of uh, books for um, um, uh, for people. So and from sorting out, filtering out great pictures on Flickr and social media, and now you're a publisher of books. Yeah, we, we are a publisher, and we decided, okay, let's start with a just simple book without uh, many uh, features, and uh, so uh, and it takes a few months to develop. So we got it during the summer. So we choose one subject, which is uh, all the sites of uh, the UNESCO World Heritage. So there is uh, 9 11 sites, which is a bit weird this year. But <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, in this site, there are thousands and thousands of monuments. And uh, in, uh, so we collected all what we had already in pages, and we made some kind of book out of it. And, and these are all amateur pictures. These are all amateur pictures. I mean, they are professional. Uh, Eric Laforg is even part, uh, he has some, of, uh, we have some people in Photopedia who are professional, and they post their picture in Photopedia to be uh, well known, and they do it on the Flickr as well. So show us some pictures. Okay, what so. What do you find on the internet? You know, the idea after that is you get uh, pictures very high quality, so world heritage, you get, for instance, Paris with uh, the Eiffel Tower, and you just slide picture by picture, and we have all structure, and you can look at, uh, in our case, it's, uh, this book has today 25,000 pictures, which is, uh, has never been, uh, been done before, and it has like uh, 4,000 pages. And uh, you know, for each picture, you can get information. So we mash up information coming from, in this case, from uh, you know, a UNESCO uh, site. We have an agreement with UNESCO. We can use their so data. That's why you Wikipedia. call it Photopedia. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, various links that we are testing. Everything is uh, geolocalized, so you can uh, you know really travel around the world. You find some place that you like. You can see what is around. And uh, if you look at it, the result is uh, so. It's really just first showing you something that is beautiful, that may be useful, but first it is beautiful. This is what we are. So these and are digital so books. So this was a big bet. Yeah. So we launched that during the summer, and it, it took uh, just a few weeks uh, to reach uh, 500,000 downloads. Now we are over 1 million downloads, uh, over 100 million page views uh, on this thing, which is uh, absolutely enormous. And OK, now. And we are here at the web for talking about flat platforms. So what we created is a platform to create such books. And these books can be either free books that we get out of the community. So the amateur photographers or people who want to be well known, they can use this channel you know, to show their picture to the rest of the world. We always uh, you know, put the right license, the, num uh, the name of the people and everything. We, we are really working for the photographers so that they get more visibility. So these free books have huge distribution, and now what we are starting, maybe today, depends because Apple is uh, currently approving, uh, I mean, reviewing, uh, you know, our last application. We shall use this application to, uh, to be a channel of distribution for other free applications, but also paying applications. So we are now working with professional photographers who are making uh, books with us, and uh, you know, they love it. You know, uh, the coffee table book are dis disappearing from uh, the libraries today. But you also accept amateur photographers, right? Oh, it can be amateurs. Of, uh, when I say professional photographers, it's because for this kind of books, we want one author, one photographer, or a finite, finite number of photographers so that we can uh, pay them and <laughs> understand how it works. It's much more difficult. So if you when become we a book publisher, we are a real content. publisher, and we, have, uh, we make contracts that are very similar to what you can find in uh, the traditional publishing industry. We are just, uh, we give more because uh, we are good I guys. I can tell you're excited <laughs> about it, but we're going to move on. Just a little plug for you. People don't know, but you're French, right? Yeah. But you worked from day one to the last day at Next Computer back many years ago, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. With a guy called Steve Jobs or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy. yeah. And you were, I think, the spiritual father of a little object we all like? What was it called? Yeah, the answer is there's some way more about that. And the spiritual father I, I of the iPhone, come that's you. Kind of things. <laughs> so, Oleg, <laughs> you took a different approach to pictures on the internet. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a co-founder of Fotolia.com. I don't know, maybe if you can put the website on. <laughs> yeah, can you put it, Ted? Yeah. Right. Uh, so Fotolia. Yeah, yeah Fotolia.com. So it's a, it's a marketplace for stock photography where uh, any photographer can come, uh, uh, open an account, start uploading images, and uh, we will have uh, our internal people who will check the quality of the image and if um, it's legal images, if they don't infringe any rights. And uh, once the image is accepted, it will uh, enter our search engine and will be proposed on sale right now in 15 countries to, uh, to people who need uh, stock photography. Can we put the uh, computer up so we see it? Yeah, great, thanks. So you took over stock photography. Uh, I thought the brand was Getty Images. Yeah, it's Getty Images. The, the main difference between us and Getty Images is that we're uh, 100 times cheaper. Uh, 100 times cheaper. Yeah, more or less. Do you because, call that uh, disruption? Uh, uh, yeah, so it's kind of disruptive, yeah. Uh, you still need to pay something, but very cheap. And, uh, What's an average price of a picture? Uh, it's between $1 and $10. So it's one around and $10. Yeah, so average price is $3 for a royalty-free license. And uh, with Getty Images, it will cost $300, the same image. So if I put a picture on my website or on my brochure, on my book, I go to Fotolia and I buy it and I pay what? You pay $3 and you can $3. use it. Yeah, and you can use it in, in fact on your website but also on the brochure because it's royalty free. So you can use and reuse the image as long as you want. How many so, photographers do you have in there? So uh, it's a crowdsource model and um, uh, we have 80,000 photographers who uh, upload daily over 20,000 uh, professional images. It's not like the type of images you will find on Flickr where it will be dogs and, you know, grandparents or whatever. It's really, uh, I mean, good images. And uh, so it can be either amateurs or real professionals, but they will, uh, they will shoot concepts and they will also invest, you know, in the shootings because it's images that uh, need to be absolutely perfect, high resolution and uh, so uh, This seems to be a very small business. Can you tell us numbers or not? Yeah, it's not very big, but this year we'll, we'll finish close to $100 million revenue. Excuse so me? $100 million. Uh, Crowdsource pictures, you're doing 100 million revenue on Yeah, it? by selling pictures for $3. Yeah, so the, 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 the demand for images is tremendous uh, worldwide because uh, if you just look at the domain names registered, I think there is 40 or 50 million dom domains, you know, and uh, so it means normally there should be as many websites and every website needs images. So, uh, How many oh, countries do you operate in? Right, well, we cover the world, but we're, right now the site is uh, translated is in 15 languages. So, uh, and yeah. you're from where? I'm French. You're French? Yeah, <laughs> my no. name is, doesn't sound French, but I'm French so you can Russian origins. So you can create 100 million revenue companies with crowdsource models in photography out of France. Yeah, it's uh, this. Well, we in fact the company was registered in the U.S., but all the co-founders, me, Thibault, and uh, and Patrick, uh, we are uh, we're all French. Yeah. yeah. And you're a serial entrepreneur, I hear. Sorry. You're a serial entrepreneur. This is not your first business. Uh, no, it's my uh, second business. Before that, I created um, uh, Amen, which is a web French web, web hosting company that we sold in 2004. Yeah. We have a few minutes to open up for questions. If anyone wants to uh, ask something to our great panel over here. No? So what are the plans? Yeah, I, I, I don't see it. Is there a mic somewhere in the front row? Yeah, here. Please, uh, front row. Yeah, but it goes for the live stream. No, so uh, we, we need to get it on the mic. Yeah, Bill please. Sanders, Introduce yourself. and uh, spe uh, Bill Sanders. Yeah. Uh, speaking of disruptive technologies, you're seeing a lot of the video coming into the, to the digital SLRs. What's that impact on your business models and what you guys are talking about right now? So impact of videos on the photography business models. Who's taking up that? Oleg? So for professional user, we, we see, I mean, we also sell uh, stock videos. So uh, it's not as big as uh, images, but for different reasons. Uh, because an image, you can use it, you know, it's, uh, you don't need to, to retouch it or heavily. Uh, uh, w w whether uh, a stock video, it will be used, you know, to integrate in a more uh, wider video. So it's um, really uh, more complicated to use. But we feel a, a big growth uh, in video usage. And th that's why we thought that may maybe, you know, we could create a tool also to create videos out of images. And we launched a service called FlixTime, uh, which uh, it's like a slideshow, but a clever slideshow that will... Uh, we, we will create slideshows out of music also and, uh, and, and a small, really, really great video in a few minutes that you can use and put on your website and uh, so, uh, yeah. And Madeline, Kodak moved from photography to video as well, right? With, yes, with we all devices. Both. Yeah, because of the importance. I mean, YouTube is, is the second biggest search engine, so 
people love video and they love to shoot. I mean, the most famous one are some cats or some um, singing dogs on YouTube. So Even it's the normal daily yeah. life Kodak moments that they want to capture on video, yeah. A Kodak moment. <laughs> Just will go for that. I think we had a question over there. Hello. Hello. And then over there. I think he was first. Hello, I'm a founder of a website that uh, delivers photos from personal content, personal photos. And I wanted to know your opinion on all these pictures that we upload to Facebook and Picasa and all these websites. And today we have not really changed much the way we view these photos. You know, we still need to go on some page and browse through the photos and so on. Do you think we'll see some evolution in the way also we consume the, the photos that our friends take? Yeah, I, I think you already have. I mean, that was the point I was making earlier with the fact that for hundreds of years, really all you had was either exhibition or journalism being in print somewhere. And print is uh, rapidly being taken over by a lot of what digital media has become. Um, just, you know, I think it's really interesting too, the different viewpoints that we've had up here. Um, particularly speaking to the Facebook, Flickr, you know, that kind of thing. And let me know if I'm not answering your question. What's interesting is I think there's a space that Kodak actually, um, and I'm very surprised in a good way to see that they're trying to fill is this, this, you know, not only is everyone a photographer, you know, you hear people say that, well, everyone's a photographer now. Well, everyone's also a publisher, and that's extremely strong. Uh, I mean, that statement takes a lot of weight. Did anybody see there was a video that was posted on the New York Times last week that was hilarious? It was a... Uh, it was a, basically the, the uh, guy who wrote the article was breaking up with his point and shoot camera. Did anybody see this? So anyway, you hear the, the piano playing in the background. You see this man sitting in a park. And he says, well, you know, it's not you, it's me. And, and uh, look, you know, you deserve for me to be honest. I won't lie to you. He said, I found someone else in the pan camera pants over this little point and shoot sitting on the desk. And he says, you know, sure, at mountain mode and still mode, those were all important to me. And now they're not important to me anymore. And, and he's saying his smartphone, sure, it doesn't take the the pictures that the other one did, but the values have changed. It's a hilarious kind of spin on, on a breakup. But I think Kodak, uh, by pursuing that, has the chance to really knock this out of the park because no one else is doing it. Nikon's post a link doing on it. Uh, Twitter, Ted Forbes is your Twitter handle. And Ted Forbes is Twitter. Question over there. Yeah, actually, Mark from PayPal, but I have a question which is rather of private interest. Does it work better? No, it works better. Um, both Photoalia and um, what, what, Photo. Hopefully, I'm doing this right. You have talked about a curator model to do the ratings and kind of you know decide which photos you actually are through. Is there anything in your model which is more kind of crowd rating and, and leveraging the opportunity to have a community out there which gives you guidance on what's a great picture and what's kind of you know filling your criteria? I guess the question, Jamal, is how do you It's very difficult to hear you. I didn't hear I did, I'm not sure I understood the question. Do you mean, the, can the community decide if it's a good picture or not, instead exactly of ourselves? What, exactly, whether you use this Yeah, as for, a for us, it's a little bit complicated. We tried that, but it didn't work, because, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the, we, we are still a transaction-based business, you know? So it's a competition between photographers. So if, you know, other photographer would rate the picture of somebody else who competes on the same image, it can create conflicts. So for us, it doesn't work. I mean, we need to, to have like a really a completely neutral editing team and people who are not linked, you know, to the final interest of the picture. Any more questions in the room? Yeah, front row. Good afternoon, Camilo from Belgium. So I have a question in the same, fee, in the same wave of, as the previous guy over there. So up so far, we consume the pictures as just 2D sets of pixels. But behind the picture, there is a story. Behind the picture, there is a kind of emotion. There is something. It's like when you go to the museum, you see a painting, and if you have the luck to be next to a person who knows with the painting, it tells you that story. Nowadays, we, okay, we have some format which adds the time of the, uh, where the, the shoot was done, uh, the, the camera and so on, but not about this emotion. So do you think that we see a future where next to the picture, which will still be a set of pixels, there will be some media associated with it, and not only a post on the blog. You know what I mean? Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's an interesting topic. You, you know, the old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, in Google's eyes, a picture is barely worth any words. And the problem is, is, I mean, as these guys can tell you, I mean, the tagging, the metadata that's included, that it's extremely important. I mean, you are telling a story. And, you know, I think if you're going to be a successful publisher, self-publishing, I mean, you really got to have that in there too, being able to have that text. I don't, did you have a question that, that I'm kind of avoiding here? 
Was that basically what you were saying? Yeah, being able to do audio. Well, I think that's the appeal of video as daytime. well, you know, um, yeah. being able to tell that story with moving pictures as well still. So. Melon? We actually tried to use that a little bit because okay. we, we agree a photo says more than 1,000 words. And if you go to kodakmoments.com, the web page, there you can upload your Kodak moments where you think like special moments. And there you have like a, like a wheel where you can say what emotion this photo um, has. So kind of like you add that data to the photo. So it doesn't do it automatically, but yeah. So you have not only the GPS and the um, time and which camera you used, and uh, so also, okay, what do you think, what, what is the photo expressing? So we kind of tried that with this. So maybe you visit that, yeah. Just before we wrap up, I have a question for each of you. Uh, I'll start with Oleg. Do you shoot film or digital? Sorry? You take pictures yourself. Uh, yeah, digital, of course. What is your favorite camera? Uh, uh, Canon Mark II. It's a little bit heavy, but I like 5D the... Mark II. No, Canon, Canon Mark II, not the 5D, the Mark II. Mark II. Just the Mark II, yeah. So. Okay, and what, you sh what lens do you use? I forgot, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jean-Marie, what's your favorite camera, film or digital? Yeah, it's a Mark II and I have uh, two lenses, uh, this one, 24-105 and uh, 70 20 uh, and, uh, and I had much more before, but uh, everything was stolen very recently. <laughs> Madeleine, um, favorite camera? I also have a Canon 5D, <laughs> so. So digital as well. Digital, yes. Ted? All these five days, I'm the only one who brought mine. <laughs> uh, I actually shoot uh, digital and film still. Uh, my favorite camera to shoot is, is a pinhole camera with nothing on it. So no Holga. Lens. Holga. <laughs> the old style, Russian style. Old school. And so far, I shoot 5D as well. Well, yeah, the, uh, the eight-hour exposure is not going to work here, but uh, people move too done. fast. Yeah. Well, please join me Ro in thanking Ro our... Ro yeah? Rodrigo, what camera do you use? Uh, 5D Mark II. 5D Mark II, so it's definitely a Canon crowd here today. Yeah, well, there's a Nikon guy. Gary Scheinberg is running around with his camera as well out there. <laughs> Anyways, join me in thanking our panel. Thank you for your insights. Absolutely. Thank you very much for this panel, which is fantastic. I, we let it run long because it was such an interesting discussion. If you go quickly, we have the uh, startup competition finals are about to begin in the main hall, and that concludes it for the second plenary uh, of the web in this hall. Thank you very much.